When I tell people that A Clockwork Orange is my favourite movie, they usually look at me like I'm a perverse weirdo. What? That one where a guy rapes and murders people is your favourite movie? Yes, it is. Are those the specific reasons I love it? Of course not. So let's take a closer look at what makes it my favourite. Before I begin though, this is the first video about a movie I've ever made, and I've had some struggles with how to structure it, so please bear with me as I try to figure this out. When I was 14 or so, my sister told me about a conversation she had had with our dad, when he told her that the only movie he never wanted her to watch was A Clockwork Orange. He never told me this, but from that moment I was intrigued. A few weeks or months later, I was flicking through the channels and I saw it playing on ITV4. Ooh, here's that movie my dad doesn't want my sister watching, so let's watch it. The first thing that struck me was, well, the first thing. I'm sure it would strike anyone seeing it for the first time. The opening is excellent. From the musical score, the bright titles, and then the first shot of Alex, his droogs, and the milk bar. This is gonna be one hell of a journey, I thought back then, and still today whenever I have the pleasure of watching again. There is him, that is Alex, and his three droogs, that is Pete, Georgie, and Dim. Alex is the leader of his little gang, and is probably the most twisted of the lot but it is the twisted characters I often enjoy watching the most. There's nothing more boring than a generic hero, or even a generic bad guy. But in the case of Alex, he is a bad guy in a world of bad guys. He isn't particularly lovable, and for most of the movie it's hard to even feel sympathy for him, but he is very enjoyable to watch. He comes across as very intelligent and charismatic, which makes for many great scenes throughout. We begin on a typical night for Alex and his droogs, they drink some milk, they beat up an old homeless man, then confront Billy Boy and his gang. The brawl is an over-the-top, bordering on comical routine, with flying furniture and insane moves, accompanied by a rousing soundtrack which lives long in the memory. Afterwards, they steal a mortar and play a hogs of the road, before coming to the home of a writer and his wife. The old surprise visit soon follows where Alex and his droogs, but mostly Alex, trash the home, beat up the writer, and rape his wife, all while Alex gives a rendition of Singing in the Rain. Already at this point, the notion that Alex could ever be seen as a likeable character goes out of the window. There's no reason for this violence, there is no greater meaning, Alex is just a criminal. The gang then return to the milk bar where we first learn of Alex's love for Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, when a lady begins to sing a small part of it. Dim, who is dim by name and by nature, doesn't appreciate the lady's performance as much as Alex feels he should, so punishes Dim with a swift key to the thigh. Another favourite moment of mine ensues when Dim initially threatens to fight Alex in retaliation, but when Alex confidently accepts the offer, Dim backs down and blames it on tiredness. We then learn of Alex's home life, in a typical urban block of flats where he lives with his parents. We see that he has a drawer full of money and other items stolen from his victims, a snake named Basil, and a fancy music system. Alex plays some music and drifts into his imagination, seeing vampires, a person being hanged, and explosions. Once again affirming that Alex is a sick individual, with the only motivation for his crimes being a love of violence. The next day, Alex skips school, to the annoyance of his parents, promising he will try to make it there for the afternoon. Once Alex finally rolls out of bed at god knows what time, he is greeted by Mr. Deltoid, Alex's youth rehabilitation officer who asks some questions about the previous night's activities in regards to Billy Boy's gang. Mr. Deltoid is a very pleasant man with a distinctive way of speaking which once again adds a little comedy value to what is mostly a bleak and shocking experience. At face value, I wish we got to see more of Mr. Deltoid, but when I think of it a little harder, maybe it's the briefness of his time in this movie that makes me enjoy it the most. After a visit to the record store, and a bit of the old in-out in-out, Alex finds his droogs waiting for him at the bottom of the stairs of his flat block. They talk about a big plan and a new way for the gang, and Alex is annoyed that some rather large talk has happened while he wasn't in attendance. The seeds of tyranny have been sowed. This is already too much for Alex to accept, and he punishes Georgie and Dim as they walk along the marina, ultimately cutting Dim's hand. A while later they're all together in a pub, where Alex confirms that order has been restored and he is their one true leader. He then wants to know more about this plan. George tells of a lady who runs a health farm, but since it's off season, she is there all alone. So later that night the droogs go there and try the same method they had used at the writer's house. 
asking to use a telephone because of an accident. However, the lady doesn't fall for it. While she is phoning the police to alert them of this, Alex breaks in through a window and confronts the woman. The lady attempts to hit Alex with a small bust, and Alex fends her off with the, uh, thing. Before the lady falls to the ground and Alex gives her a bash on the head for good measure. He then hears the police siren, so rushes outside. There his droogs are waiting, and when Alex asks them what they are waiting around for, Tim smashes a milk bottle in Alex's eyes, leaving him incapacitated and easy enough for the police to catch. In the police station, after some interrogation and antagonising, Mr Deltoid arrives to let Alex know that his lady victim has died, making him a murderer. Off to the big house for little Alex. On the day Alex is taken to prison, we meet the chief guard, an uptight bastard who barks orders and follows protocol to the letter. He also makes for some amusing scenes, especially later on. After two years in prison, having kept his nose clean by helping the prison chaplain, Alex finds out about an experimental treatment for violent convicts. When the governor comes to select some prisoners for the trial, Alex seizes the opportunity to speak up, which grabs the governor's attention, successfully earning himself a place in the trial that offers complete reform in two weeks. The trial is known as the Ludovico Technique, and uses a method of drugging the patient, then forcing them to watch violent movies, where they will start to feel sick and like they are going to die. This creates a correlation in their brains between the violence they see and the sickness they feel, which leads them to not wanting to experience any sort of violence in their lives, and thus curing them of their violent ways. During the treatment, one of the movies Alex is shown features a background score of Beethoven, once Alex realises this, he pleads with the doctors to turn it off, exclaiming it is a sin to use Ludwig van in such a manner. Dr Brodsky tells Alex nothing can be done, and then privately tells Dr Brannan that maybe this will act as punishment and that the governor will be pleased. Once Alex is released, he heads back home to find that his parents have rented his room out to a pompous, toast-loving prick named Joe. Actually, he mostly seems like a normal bloke, definitely not a thug like Alex. But with this scene coming just after we've seen Alex go through this brutal psychological torture, it definitely makes Joe seem like a dick. So Alex can't move back in with his parents, and to top it off all his possessions and his snake are gone too. He heads off to try to make it on his own, when he runs into the homeless man he beat up at the beginning of this twisted tale. The man and a group of other homeless oldies attack Alex, with the Ludovico treatment leaving him incapable of defending himself. Luckily, two policemen soon come to the rescue, dispersing the horde of homeless and saving Alex. Unluckily, those two policemen turn out to be Georgian Dim. They take Alex into a remote part of the countryside where they beat and drown him to within an inch of his life. Oh, I wish we got to see the comeuppance of those two, but sadly, that's the last we see of the Droogs. Later that night, we see Alex stumbling into a familiar place, the home of the rider he had attacked years earlier but in his distressed state, he did not recognise where he was. Alex is taken in by the writer's helper before he suddenly remembers where he is. He's confident that the writer won't recognise him, as back then he had worn a mask, and it appears to be the case at first as the writer only recognises him as the bloke from the papers who had undergone the Ludovico treatment. The writer, who is very politically motivated against the use of this treatment and the current government, sees Alex as an opportunity to get some first-hand information that could work in his favour. He insists that Alex takes a hot bath to recover, whilst he makes some important phone calls. While Alex is relaxing in the bath, he begins with a weary humming, before eventually belting out another rendition of Singing in the Rain, which the writer hears through the door, and then realises who Alex truly is. What follows is a very tense scene where Alex is eating when the writer comes in and offers Alex wine. In the scene, Alex does a great job of really portraying what I feel while watching. Very uneasy and nervous about the wine, ultimately ending with Alex stating that at any second, he feels like something terrible is about to happen, before he passes out face first into his dinner. Alex awakes in a locked room to the sound of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, which invokes the same sick feeling as violence would thanks to the Ludovico treatment and we see the writer and his friends downstairs enjoying Alex's faint screams over the blaring music. The only way out for Alex is to jump out of the window, resulting in major injuries and a coma. Alex wakes from his coma to find that people are appalled at the government for the use of the Ludovico technique. Alex gets a visit from a psychologist who wants to check how he is recovering by playing a game. 
This is another example of a funny scene to really break up the despair that most of the movie brings. The movie comes to a close when the governor visits Alex to apologise for what has happened, letting him know that the writer has been locked up, and Alex will have a good job lined up for him once he is out of hospital, and that everything is going to be okay. Once Alex is happy with this, the governor brings in a music system as a treat, followed by some photographers to snap pictures of Alex and the governor together as friends. Bloody politicians, eh? There isn't a single aspect of A Clockwork Orange that I dislike. The story, the characters, the videography, the soundtrack, everything. It did take me a few viewings though, to really appreciate all of these things together, but once it all clicked in my brain, every viewing has been an audio-visual experience that I am yet to find anything close to. Another thing that took me a few viewings was the NADSAT language that is used throughout the movie. It's a mix of English, Russian and Cockney rhyming slang, and on my first viewing I was confused as to what the hell Alex and his droops were talking about half of the time. But the more I watched, the more I understood the context of the words, and I think it adds a lot of charm to the film. This was the first Stanley Kubrick movie I saw, and back when I was 14 I'd never even heard of Kubrick or knew of his legendary status. A Clockwork Orange introduced me to his unique style of direction, and has led me to watch more Kubrick movies which, so far, have all been incredible. But A Clockwork Orange will probably always be my favourite. So that's that. A little look at A Clockwork Orange and how it isn't just a movie for weirdos and perverts. Hopefully people will stop giving me funny looks, or I can stop lying about my favourite movie, because to me it really is a masterpiece. Nobody is afraid to say they like the Mona Lisa, are they?